All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We are here with After the Bite, hearing some Shark Tank founders give you the behind the scenes look at their stories and experiences. I'm um, Carolyn Rods with Alice. Alice is a digital platform that helps entrepreneurs and small business owners around the world get connected with resources that are relevant to their business, all based on where they live, what stage of growth they're at, uh, what industry they're in, and their unique personal and company profiles, um, helping you filter through the millions of resources available for, for your business. Um, and finding the few that are right for you. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Alice, it is free for every business owner. Um, and we prioritize resources for women and minorities and other underserved entrepreneurs. Um, so you can join at helloalice.com. Uh, we'll also have some resources there. We'll be sharing this webinar, the recording of this webinar, if you want to share it with others. And we'll also have a collection to share for you on some other resources that can help you if you're interested in following in the footsteps of Rose and Chelsea um, who are joining us here today. And just as a reminder, we have a second um, webinar that we're doing in partnership with Mark Cuban Companies on July 16th. So you can find information on Alice as well for that. Uh, so with that, I want to um, just say thank you to Mark Cuban Companies for partnering with us. We're really excited about this partnership and all that we've done with them um, over the past months and really you know, are excited about the diversity of their portfolio. Um, one of the things that we really love about Mark Cuban and, and all that he's invested in is that he has lots of female founders like the ones that we'll be meeting with today. Uh, but also veterans and minorities and lots of different others who are, are diversifying the face of entrepreneurship. Uh, so I want to do a quick intro uh, to our guests today. Uh, we have Rose Wang and Chelsea Burganti. Rose is with Chirps Chips um, and Chirps Chips exists to normalize eating insects so that society can envision a sustainable food system um, where insects are grown in urban areas and fed on food waste. Uh, they use crickets milled into flour to make high protein tortilla chips. Uh, I'm actually, I've tried these before. <laughs> they are indeed delicious. So uh, Rose, you want to do a quick uh, introduction? Hi everyone, my name is Rose. Um, I am the CEO co-founder of Chirps and um, we started this company about four years ago and initially um, it's just me and my college roommate Laura so anything is possible um, and it's exactly like Carolyn said is we really envision a world where um, we completely change the food system where we rely on um, sustainable farming and a sustainable protein source uh, like insects so that we can shift the impact the food system has on our environment. And people don't know this, but uh, livestock industry is the biggest contributor to environmental problems today. And so this is one of the biggest issues we can be tackling. Uh, and I'll tell you more about it later. Great, thank you. Uh, and then we have Chelsea Berganti with Lollyware, which is the world's first edible bioplastic company that is replacing plastic with edible, hyper-compostable materials. Um, it is much cooler um, than this very scientific definition that I don't understand, but I'm uh, excited. I'll turn it over to Chelsea. Chelsea, tell us a little bit about what that means. Hi, guys. How are you? Chelsea here, uh, CEO of Lollyware Edible Bioplastics. And um, yes, as mentioned, we're dedicated to replacing plastic and solving the plastics crisis by using seaweed intelligence um, within all of our products. So we've been pioneering this space since um, early 2010, went to market in 2014, and we we're in the tank in 2015. So I'm really excited to share with you what we've learned along the way and how we've transformed this new category of edible packaging, excuse me, into the future of um, what we're calling a post-plastic era. So really excited to share more. And around, at around the 20 minute mark, I'll have a couple scientists pop in and show you what we've been working on in the lab, which is the, uh, the future of um, drinking straws, which are um, a huge problem in our oceans at about 100 billion per year. Great, thank you both. And just for everybody who's listening in, uh, we are taking questions throughout, so feel free to pop in. There's a Q&A &A button that you should see at the bottom. Um, and then also a chat if you have any comments that you wanna share. 
Um, so feel free to do those. We'll save some time at the end for Q and A, um, but you can drop those in throughout uh, uh, our conversation here. And this is really casual, so y'all jump in with anything that that you want to pipe in, and no rhyme or reason or order to this. So, um, so just to kick it off, um, what it compelled you both to start your companies in the first place? All the things you could have done. You obviously have lots of great ideas. What was it about this particular idea that that led you to start this company? Should, so I just start. Go for it. Ro okay. Sorry, Rose. No, uh, no great question. It. Great question. Rose would probably agree that um, there's so many reasons uh, why you start a company. But I think ultimately um, choosing a space that you're really excited about, you see a lot of potential in, one maybe that hasn't evolved for a long time. So, for example, the plastics industry has been around in its same format for, you know, over a century. And if you look at the the products that we use every day, plastic straws, cups, and lids, these products are all built to last. And what I mean by that is uh, most of these products that you use on average for 28 minutes uh, last for hundreds of years. So that logic seemed fundamentally flawed, and that was a great opportunity for us to dive into, uh, reimagine um, the plastics crisis and how we could impact it and change it. And so we thought, hey, what if you could actually transform disposables into something that could be eaten, something that's hyper-compostable, to revolutionize this space, to transition from this notion of built to last into a new philosophy of design to disappear. So all of our products at Lollyware, um, they're all designed to disappear. And what I mean by that is um, that you can either, number one, eat your package, which is super fun. Uh, so imagine your vanilla straw in your cold brew at Starbucks. Imagine a strawberry straw in your milkshake at McDonald's. That's super fun, right? So that's a huge um, innovation that we've been pioneering. Uh, the second way you can disappear it is by composting it. So all of our products go from cup to, or straw or lid to soil in approximately 60 days. If they end up in a marine environment, they'll simply uh, break down in a matter, of, uh, a matter of days versus centuries. And the third way you could disappear it is uh, a really cool new form of what we call anaerobic digestion. So that's actually taking a bunch of food scraps, which Lollyware is actually, and, and creating biogas from it. And so being able, to, being able to power machinery and other uh, industrial equipment with biogas. So there's three ways that you can disappear your packaging, which is completely new. And we're calling this a post-plastic era. So our goal is to replace uh, 1 billion plastic disposables by 2020. And the reason why I'm so excited about this space is because we're all aware of the plastics crisis in the marine environment. Having grown up in Hawaii, being a surfer, being a scuba diver, uh, diving down hundreds of feet with my dad growing up, um, I, I was privy to the beginnings of that plastic crisis and I've seen how it's evolved over time. We're, our, we're in the middle of a crisis in our oceans and I think Lollywood can play a key role in diverting a lot of that plastic waste uh, from the marine environment and uh, I'm just really passionate about the ocean space and ocean tech in general. So I'm really excited to share more. Thanks so much. I'm a huge fan, huge fan of Chelsea. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I just want to say real quick, like to me, we are focused so much on the future, space, all of that. But right now our oceans need to be cleaned up. And if we spent some of that money that we're spending on the new frontier, but cleaning up what we have right now, what's so precious, I think that's the way to go. So super huge fan. Definitely. This is what it's all about, supporting each other. Um, Absolutely. But for Chirps, uh, our story just happened where I was traveling abroad in China and I saw a street vendor selling fried scorpions. And I was with a bunch of friends and everybody was daring each other to eat it. And I stepped up and I tried it. Uh, and my first thought was, oh my God, this tastes like shrimp. Um, <laughs> so when I got back to the US, my college roommate, Laura, who's now my co-founder, sent me an article about eating bugs. And I was like, no way, I just had uh, a scorpion in China. And when we were reading this article, we realized that there's so much more behind the food that we were eating. It's not just this food showed up at your table and, or in your fridge. Um, there's a lot of resources miles that this food had to travel to get to where you are and that has a huge effect on our planet and so what was so exciting about insects is that not only is it a resource efficient little critter itself but rather it is solving for four of the largest issues in food today 
Um, and so we looked at this as a full system change. And also at the end of the day, it takes risk takers to bring something so different to market and we had nothing to lose. We just graduated from college, we didn't have families, and we thought if we could spend the rest of our lives solving for one of the biggest problems in the world, then that's a life worth living. And so that's why we did it. Props to you both on solving big problems in the world because those are our favorite kinds of companies and one of the reasons that we love getting more women entrepreneurs um, funded and supported. So absolutely you know, very important work. Uh, just so that everybody knows, how can they go support? What, what is your website? Where should they go to support your, your companies? So for Lollyware, we'd love for you to check out our Instagram, just at Lollyware and follow our progress. We do really fun stories and have really uh, engaging content and always just looking to um, spread the word and um, bring on more people to help us solve this tremendous um, plastic crisis. And then of course, www.lollyware.com just for more info. And if you guys want to eat cricket chips, you can go to churchchips.com um, or follow us at churchchips or find us on Amazon. Great. Thanks, you both. So, all right, let's get into the Shark Tank uh, details. So you both landed this highly coveted spot on Shark Tank. Tell us about that experience. Rose, you want to kick it off? Yeah. Um, so it's actually really funny. We had met Robert Herjavec at an event um, years ago. So we, we aired last year, 2017, in January. Um, and he was um, – so Robert was a – host at a gala that we were attending and I was actually on stage pitching chirps and he grilled me and said you know we've had another cricket company on the show like why would you want it like what makes you different what makes you special he's very skeptical and he was like no no other cricket company is going to go on Shark Tank so we thought there was no chance that we were ever going to go on um, and then we had a friend who dared us when there was an open casting call in 2016 in San Francisco and he was like just do it. Like you have nothing to lose. Um, and if, if you guys make it, we'll go to Vegas. So that was like the <laughs> premise for it. We're like, okay, I guess this is a win-win. Um, awesome. So we went to the open casting call. Um, it only took, you know, five or 10 minutes. We just fine to our pitch. Uh, and that day, they, at the end of the day, they came back to us and said, you know, you're one of our in San Francisco. We'd love for you to move on to the second round. Um, and so that's how it happened. Um, and through that process, we just did our best, just was ourselves. Um, I think that's the best advice I can give you. Uh, I think two girls starting a cricket chip company is really fun. Um, and the Shark Tank producers really like that. And so, um, yeah, it was about a six month process. And then we, what, what do you think it was about your application that stood out? It's really just be yourself and show lots of personality. Um, I think for us, we are our brands. We love what we do. We have so much fun every day. It's why we're four years in and still going strong. And so I think the more you can be authentic, show who you are, um, be honest about what you're going after, um, that's the best thing you can do. Great. And Chelsea, what about you? How did you guys end up on there? Um, what happened was the Shark Tank producers saw us in Oprah magazine as one of Oprah's favorite things of the year on her annual wow list and reached out and said, hey, we think that um, you should apply. And it was never really on our radar. Actually, it's funny because Shark Tank is Shark Tank and The Prophet are my two favorite um, primetime shows. And I never really considered going on there um, until the producers reached out. And I would say, you know, it's a difficult process, just real talk. Um, they, you know, there's, uh, Rose can probably agree, there's a lot of paperwork. Um, it took <laughs> us about six months to go through the whole due diligence process to actually get into the tank. It's very time consuming. Um, it's a lot of mental energy, um, so you have to really commit to it. Yeah. And um, I would recommend it to anyone because you actually learn a lot about your business along the way. It's a, basically a really intensive due diligence process without any guarantee of funding, of course. So it's very similar 
grows right to the whole investment process of you know, being vetted by um, investors, but this time you're being vetted by the producers and everyone on behalf of the investors, and then you have to go and pitch again. So it's actually maybe even harder. Um, but we went through the whole process. We worked with these amazing women who head up the, the screening committee. And um, I think I learned a tremendous amount, which I'm happy to share more of, but it'll probably take another episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I think the other key thing I would add is that we never relied on Shark Tank for our business. And I think that's really key is that the process itself, um, it was a nice to have if we ever got on Shark Tank, but we never thought, okay, this is the make or break for our business because it's a total crash. You don't know if you're going to be able to make it onto the show. So many people apply, so many people audition. And so, yeah, yeah exactly. So, Ultimately, it still comes down to you, you need to be operating a real business that you truly care about, regardless of Shark Tank. Um, and I think they're looking for that, too. They're not looking for businesses that are in existence just for Shark Tank. So having been through the process now, and both successfully, congratulations, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to yourselves if you were to do it all over again, or to others who might be considering it? You shared a little bit, but any other, any other words of advice? Ooh, um, I'll take this question first. Um, so it's actually really funny because it's a, it seems like an investor pitch when you go in. In, in the beginning and the end part aren't when you're not in the tank, but once you're in the tank, it is you're sitting in a front of a panel of investors who are asking you questions. So it really does feel like an investor pitch. But at the end of the day, it's still TV. <laughs> and I think that's something that um, we – might have forgotten um, when we were in the tank because it was just, you, you like black out and you just, all you can think about is answering the questions or at least that's what happened to me. Um, and I, I would suggest practicing um, some of the answers, questions and answers beforehand and injecting as much personality into those um, Q and A sessions um, for us. People say that we were this one of the smoothest pitches they had ever seen, which I think is really awesome. But in some ways, it's not great for TV because it's not as memorable. Um, so I think that might be in something that um, is interesting in hindsight. Is you know how does how do you tailor something for TV versus for investment? And they're two very different things. Um, I think the other thing I would suggest is we practiced a lot of the Q&A, but we didn't practice the negotiation aspect. We didn't even think about them offering a deal. <laughs> um, and once we got there, it happened so fast. And these are real numbers, and it's real money. Um, and so I would really suggest that you practice the negotiation aspect um, in real time. All right, looking back, are you happy with the deal you got? Oh my gosh, totally. We were, we were so ecstatic to get Mark Cuban as an investor. He's one of our favorite sharks. Uh, we're generally just entrepreneurs in general. So to have him as an investor and advisor has been a dream come true. And Chelsea, you all had a shark brawl on the show. <laughs> what was going through your head during all of that? Um, yeah, there was definitely a turning point where First of all, Leanne and I had uh, had two cups of bulletproof coffee <laughs> before going into the tank. Uh, and so we were so hyped and amped and probably over caffeinated. So I was talking so quickly. Honestly, I think we blacked out, both of us. Um, <laughs> yeah, common experience. All of a sudden, um, I think we uh, effectively FOMO'd the sharks. And, um, and we realized there was a turning point when Robert said, um, how much are you raising? How much is left in the round? And so it went from our ask of, um, I think 150,000 for 10% to all of a sudden the sharks were gonna close the whole round. And we had to act swiftly to, to, Rose point, to Rose's point um, to effectively negotiate. But Leanne and I had talked about, um, we really believe in the, the power of manifesting and um, intentionality and going in there with a, a clear um, intention of what you want the outcome to be. So we had already decided that we'd only give up a certain percentage and we definitely wanted Mark Cuban and Barbara Corcoran and that's exactly what happened. So when we realized that what was on the table was a, a deal that was four times bigger at double the valuation, we jumped on it, especially with Mark Cuban leading the way. And ultimately we didn't 
go with Robert. He wasn't on our docket of, uh, of sharks we wanted to close with. Um, we walked out of the tank with, uh, yeah, four times the amount of money and double the valuation and the two sharks that we wanted, so I can't complain. <laughs> and actually, our episode has re-aired 33 times. Wow. Um, um, uh, I'm not sure if Abe knows this. I think he's watching. But our, our episode is one of the most re-aired episodes of all time, apparently. Um, I think it's because the really exciting episode, we close out the, the episode, but be, the three other companies before had massive energy. Um, there's a little bit of drama in there. So it's just a, overall a great episode to watch. And that's um, season seven, episode two. That's amazing. 33 times. I'm sure that's been very that's awesome. in your business as well. Yeah, a little boost every time. <laughs> and uh, as, uh, as, Ray's, as Rose can probably contest, uh, the most valuable advertising, or the most expensive, not the most valuable, is um, TV air. So if it keeps re-airing, it's just uh, lollywood spreading across every continent. Um, it's re-aired across you know, the biggest countries. So that's obviously great for an entrepreneur. Totally. We say that Shark Tank is the gift that keeps on giving. Keeps on yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And what happens after? So you, you make a deal with the sharks on TV. What's the follow up to that? Uh, in what sense, like closing the deal or what yeah, the, what what the, the paperwork like? and, and making all of that reality? I mean, it takes so long to sign the deal. And uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, you work six months to get into the tank and then another probably six months on further due diligence and closing a deal. Um, I would say that it's um, even more of a remarkable opportunity that I had, than what I had ever imagined. I kind of thought that we'd get money and maybe Mark would be advising us here and there, but he actually responds to emails sometimes within the hour, I don't know how he does it, but he's just a really, he's like a superhuman and he's always said yes to us. So I, he really just is super supportive of women in business, um, green tech, um, world changing innovations that are based on a breakthrough technology that can solve a problem that impacts a billion people or more. Mark's really passionate about this space. He's just kind of a rare human. He's like a sports dude, but also a really remarkable supporter of like, like I just, everything I just mentioned. So on top of that, we have, you know, we, we got, we got to know Mark a lot more, but you also become uh, a, a, a portfolio company of Mark Cuban companies, which means that um, there's all these other things that they help you with, which I think is really unique to the Mark Cuban strategy of, um, of successful Shark Tank companies. And so I like to call him my uh, business uh, therapist, Abe Mancaro, who's Mark Cuban's right-hand man. Um, Abe and I are really close, and honestly, like, he's really helped push Lollywood forward in every which way, and I call him for everything. And, um, and like I said, Mark responds within the hour. So he's a tremendous resource. And as Rose can probably agree to, when you have Mark Cuban on your cap table, just easier to raise more money. And uh, that, that name holds a lot of uh, brand equity. So of all the things that you all received as a result of Shark Tank, sounds like mentorship, investment, media. Therapy. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> what has, as you know, you all have been able to connect with each other, so you've been able to have some peer collaboration. What has been the most impactful for your business and moved the needle the most? I mean, it, it, there's so many things, as Chelsea said, uh, that it's really hard to parse out. And it's hard to say this, this input led to this output. But um, I think there's a couple things that are really important. One is just that Shark Tank gives you such credibility and legitimacy. Shark Tank is probably like one of the most loved shows by Americans. I mean, think about this. Like before this, you talk about valuation, you talk about these terms like profit, probably most Americans didn't know what those things meant. And now Shark Tank has educated an entire popular, or just like the entire world about business and entrepreneurship and made it exciting and you can see people's dreams come to true. So I think that's really big uh, for people to just follow your story, fall in love with the story of the founders and uh, showing really the story behind the product. And I think that's really key. Um, and I think the second thing Chelsea said is with the right shark, if the shark really believes in your company and the issue you're solving. So Mark has been tremendous, not only as 
a supporter, but also because he's an he's himself an entrepreneur. So he's very pro entrepreneur. Really understands the struggles that we go through, and I think that's super important for us to find a shark who understood the journey that we we're going on. Um, and then the other part with Abe and the entire Mark Cuban Companies team is just every every aspect has been helpful. They found us our accountant. They got us set up on Amazon. I mean, I can go on and on and on about the list of things that they've been able to do for us. Um, and so we feel incredibly lucky to be part of the portfolio and to be one of Mark's companies. So this is, there has to be a pretty massive kind of fear factor going into this pitch. There's <laughs> obviously the hopes of a yes and that you're going to get this, this investment and sign a deal with one of the sharks. I'm sure you both thought about the prospect of a no and what that would mean. What was it that got you to overcome that risk factor and say this is going to be worth it either way? Um, so is the question, um, sorry, can you reframe it just one, once for me? My, yeah, how, my did, how did you overcome the, the fear and the risk of, of going into this pitch in the first place? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, if you prepare, uh, you have a certain level of confidence that is unshakable. And so, and I do believe that, you know, that's important for the whole Shark Team process. Like they always say, know your numbers. And I think that was evident on, on our episode, just having all the, having most of the answers. Um, but I wouldn't say like we were afraid. I think um, when you're an entrepreneur, you're just open to everything and you're a hyper optimist for the most part we knew that we were going to receive difficult questions and we prepared for them. So that's our perspective on that. Yeah. And I think also generally for any founder, there has to be a comfort level with no, because you are taking something that's not in existence. Um, especially for first time founders, there's no proof that you're going to be able to make this happen. Um, there's no credibility, legitimacy, and you're, we're knocking down the doors of really big incumbents like Frida Lay that have been around for <laughs> many, many decades. And so this fear of no, um, I feel like has been taken away even in the beginning. I mean, when we tried to find a manufacturer, uh, we had to call over 400 manufacturers before we found one that would work with us. That's over 400 no's. And so I think you become desensitized <laughs> to door slamming in your faces. Um, and so going on Shark Tank was just another opportunity. And that's how we saw it is, I think Chelsea's absolutely right. Being intentional about what we want out of this experience, but also being intentional about how we present ourselves and who we are. And uh, I think the other part is just being very authentic. Um, at that point, I think you put yourself out there and if the world says yes, it's great. If you say no, you try again. And that's just part of the whole startup process. Yeah, I always say the sign of a great entrepreneur is if a no fuels you to go find the solution, then you're probably cut out for entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah. if you your energy, it probably isn't the right path for you because we've all heard lots and lots of no's. So. Exactly. Uh, so you both have really non-traditional products and you are in a space where you have to convince consumers of what the new normal is. What, what's been the hardest part of making that sale and getting your products into the hands of consumers? I think a big part of success um, for uh, any small company that's trying to scale massively I'm just talking, uh, can I see that real quick? I wanna show you guys this really cool thing. So Steven, say hi. This is our R&D chemist. Hi, Steven. <laughs> Steven just brought me a Capri Sun straw of the future. This is fully edible, biodegradable. I'm gonna punch it through and you guys are gonna see that. Can you help me with this while I talk? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a good example because um, we're seeing a huge transition away from plastic. So how does Lollyware help companies solve for that? It's difficult. You really need to have a supportive uh, corporate partner. I think entrepreneur for entrepreneurs and scale up, that's critical. You need to have a, a corporate a corporate partner that will help you scale an innovation and replace the, the past. So this is Capri Sun. Um, we are working on uh, 
several innovations to replace the 100 billion uh, industrial straws, they're called, that go into soft pouches and juice boxes. It works just the same, if not better, than paper, and it's a, it's a new kind of plastic. So it's fully operational, but to get this to market with Capri Sun or anyone else who's interested, um, it takes a lot of time with testing and finding those companies that actually want to be a part of ushering in that change. And that, that partnership in tandem is key to any breakthrough innovation scaling because you need a partner. And so I just wanted to use that as an example of, yes, you have to have that replacement for them, but they also have to be willing to work with you on ushering in that change. And what that means is very, very <clears throat> uh, stringent testing uh, through life cycle analysis, through heat testing, through manufacturing. And I wouldn't be able to do that on my own. And it re definitely requires a big partner. I'm, I'm not sure, Rose, if you've experienced that because I believe you are more B2C, whereas I'm B2B. Right, so, I mean, very different. Hear, hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, and it, for different industries, they're very different needs. And so Chelsea's right now in creating new technologies in the B2B space. So it's a very different space than for a food product where we're going B2C on shelves. Um, but I think what Chelsea, the, the general concept is exactly the same. You cannot do this by yourself. It takes a village to bring a product to market and it takes experts who've been through it before, especially since we're all first time founders here. Uh, I believe that's true, right Chelsea? What was that? We're first time founders? Yes. Aside from my lemonade stand and my bunny rabbit stand at Albertsons, I guess so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Never mind, that counts. <laughs> Three times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and so I think so much of what we do is dependent on uh, the relationships that we build and solving for pain points. And so similar to Chelsea, it's about finding the opportunity within the space. And so when we first came out, um, there were a couple other protein bar companies, cricket protein bar companies, and um, I think oftentimes you only think about protein and protein bars or protein shakes. This is at least four years ago. And so um, we also pushed the boundaries there where we decided to go with a chip product. Um, and we saw that protein was a trending category, not only in the traditional categories, but across yogurts, cereals, ice cream, and also snacks. And so um, I think so much of the innovation happens not only in the product that you produce, but also the way that you think about your go-to-market strategy. So I think one of the, the reasons why we've been able to be successful, we're in over a thousand stores nationwide and growing very rapidly, and that's only made possible because we chose the right format to introduce this new product in. And I think um, I urge a lot of people to go with your gut and think through how people work emotionally, not just what makes sense on paper. because uh, when we started, everyone said, that's, you know, people aren't looking for protein in their chips. Four years later, that's not true. Uh, and I think having a crunchy product takes away some of that fear factor. Uh, so those all the considerations we had when we decided to go to market. Um, and, and there's so, I mean, we can probably have a whole nother episode or four episodes about all the other ways about thinking through how do you bring a completely non-traditional um, and different item to market because it is changing hearts and minds, which is one of the hardest things to do. How did you both prepare your company for this spike? Obviously going on Shark Tank in, in hopes of getting, you know, this attention on your company. I'm sure you were anticipating um, increased demand. Same thing with being on Oprah's list of favorite things, Chelsea. So, how would you prepare, I guess, going forward, but also what did you do you know, prior to, to get your companies ready for this influx of traffic? Shark Tank doesn't, Shark Tank doesn't make it easy for you because they don't no. tell you when you air until two to three weeks before you air. So there's not much time to prepare. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine with a, a retail product, I mean, you've got inventory issues, ready for that. Yeah, and I'll talk briefly about this. I mean, one of the biggest struggles for our product is that we have a shelf life. And so that you can't just make a bunch of inventory and sit on it because if you don't air, the range is, it could be like, we could have aired anywhere from like January to 
like January. It could have been like so long that the range of when we were on TV that you can't really prepare beforehand. And um, we work with a manufacturer who also services lots of other products. So it's not something that they can just slot in as soon as we ask them to. So there's a lot of challenges that comes with the opportunity. And I think it's a balancing act of, um, you know, do we wait? So Rose is frozen on my answer. There's been companies who don't. Okay. There we go. Yeah, Rose. Is there we go. She, Rose is back. Rose, you look really cool in slow mo and also frozen. <laughs> you you froze in a nice spot. Chelsea, what about what about you? Well, I Sorry. totally agree with Rose. Um, we didn't know to you know our airing date till two weeks prior, so we had to rush around and back up the website. And we did, um, in 24 hours, $140,000 um, in products. And we had to immediately move from our process in New York in a small scale industrial facility to having a full blown plant in Mexico. And lots of challenges along the way. Um, we were not prepared to scale that quickly. And that was a huge, that's, that's to this day has been uh, quite difficult to, to kind of uh, move forward since then in a way that, you know, just like, um, for one thing, making a product that's never been made before is quite difficult and then scaling it at the same time. So we, we realized early on that that was going to be our major challenge. And that's what happened at, in Shark Tank. We scaled quickly and had to open up a new factory and all that kind of stuff that you, that, that that poses significant challenges for the founding team. In addition to fielding thousands of marketing requests and customer service inquiries, uh, you're really in front of six million Americans. And obviously when you re-air too, you're constantly having to feel through that, which is a blessing and a curse sometimes when you're trying to just get on with uh, everyday operational duties. So you both have co-founders. Um, talked about the need for, for partnerships and having others support. What has been the biggest uh, learning, I guess, in terms of your, your co-founder and the teams that you've built in growing your companies? I think that for us, um, you know, uh, so our background is uh, industrial design, innovation, and sustainability. Um, and we, we, we our scale of ambition for Lollyware uh, exceeds our areas of expertise. So what we had to do over the past 12 months is bring on a significant scientific team. So we have a technology team of seven people, R&D chemists, chemical engineers, former Dow DuPont chemical folks who retired from Dow because they want to work in sustainability because they, they view their work at Dow as actually difficult <laughs> when when you really look at all those chemicals in the environment. So Lollyware is a redemption strategy for some of these folks is quite interesting. Um, we also have um, some like really great operational people, process engineers, et cetera. So we really had to formalize a technology team to be able to take, take Lollyware from a food technology innovation to um, a biopolymer uh, innovation and even nanotechnology. So, um, we're going to be pioneering a lot of new, new seaweed composites that are based within the nano, nanotechnology realm to um, create the next generation of products that um, that are more durable, that are cheaper. And so to, in, order, in order to pioneer that space, I even had to bring on a phycologist who's a seaweed expert. So that's been really fun working transdisciplinary. And I think that's great advising for any entrepreneur is don't look at your background um, as a as a challenge, leverage yourself as much as possible. Be the spokesperson of the brand, raise, raise the money that you need to build out an amazing team to support you. And, you know, I, we've always said we've got to surround ourselves with incredible people to, to match the scale of ambition that we have for Lollyware. And that's worked quite really well for us. So I would say view your expertise as critical, but then bring on everyone else that you need and think transdisciplinary. Great. Well, I want, we have about 20 minutes left. Uh, I wanted to turn it over to some questions from everybody listening. Uh, we have a couple here in the queue already, but feel free to add yours um, as well if any of the others of you would like to, to ask some questions. 
So Judy wants to know, how much traction did your companies have before you went on Shark Tank? Uh, we only had, uh, I think it was 130,000 in sales to date. Um, we had a bunch of LOIs from big companies. Um, but you know, we've seen successful Shark Tank pitches with pre-revenue. We've seen it with uh, extensive revenue. And I think that ultimately you need to be a strong team and have a clear path forward um, to be able to be a Shark Tank success. And I think that that's something we've seen consistently. So I wouldn't get too uh, focused on revenue, pre-revenue, whatever. Um, I would think about is my innovation, is my product necessary? Is, is there a reason for it to exist? And, and are you the team to take it forward? You know, just focus on what you're excited about. And you know, that enthusiasm and passion will shine through. And if you're the team to take that innovation to market, the sharks are gonna see that. They're not really gonna be too concerned on revenue unless you're asking for like a hundred million valuation. I will say it's a little different B2B versus B2C. So it really depends on what industry you're operating in. And so Shark Tank should be a strategic decision in your business. It, you get shown to 6 million viewers across the U.S. that one night. And if, this, if you go on the show before you're ready to scale, it's, it's not the right time. You're going to be wasting that opportunity because people – are going to be waiting for product and you won't be ready. Um, so I think that's a really important piece of advice I give entrepreneurs is don't just go on the show because you want to go on the show. Like do it because it's actually a good stepping stone for your business. Um, that said, I think like Chelsea said, it really, it's not necessarily about the traction you've had. Um, I think it's about the vision that you have going forward and then the executable plan you have in place to make those milestones uh, happen. So if, if you know, we've, I think there are companies who've gone to the show with almost no revenue, but they have a really cool piece of their technology or uh, they have a really amazing story that'll connect with the show team viewers. It, it doesn't really matter. Just bring your special sauce to the table and make it very apparent, very clear, and that will really take you a long way. Uh, so did Shark Tank assist you both? This is a question from Zawadi. Did Shark Tank assist you in scaling after the show airs? No. <laughs> uh, not at all. No, so AC is, you know, they, they do this part. Um, and it's great, but they're not going to be helping you run your business. That's not the business that ABC's in. Um, your shark, however, should be helping you afterwards. And so a shark who understands your industry or who's willing to help, that is a very important part of the process. So we have... Um Abe, I see that you're here listening in, um, but one of the questions is, what's the best advice you've received from Abe and Mark? I just texted the answer, but I'm curious to know Rose's answer too. I just said, wait, can you read what I said on there? Does it come up live? Let's see, oh yeah, Chelsea wrote, um, keep going, make progress every day, pivot quickly and be lean. Yeah, Mark gives us lots of tough love. So don't run out of gas, AKA money. Um, make progress every day and just be relentless. You know, um, one of our, two of our favorite quotes are, uh, the obstacle is the way. And our second favorite quote is, um, genius is persistence in disguise. So I think that's really how we think. And I think Mark and Abe would agree. Just be persistent and relentless. Yeah, definitely. Um, man, there's been so many great pieces of advice. I mean, I would say that um, maybe not necessarily the advice, but the process in which I love that Abe and Mark take it are that you can actually reason with them. It's not just their way or the highway. I think it's really important is to hold your ground and if you have real reasons behind why you want to push for a certain direction or a new strategy, um, as long as you present those 
reasons in a very clear manner and it's logical and it makes sense for the business, um, Abe and Mark are always open to listen and they always say, you know what, it's your business, do it, go through it, we're not going to tell you how to run your business and then if, you know, sometimes they're right, sometimes I'm right and we'll just take those learnings and never make the same mistake twice and I think that's really important um, and so I want to remind everyone out there, hold your ground. I think sometimes it's really easy to say, okay, you know what, Mark's been through this so many times, he must be right, but maybe not, the world has changed. Just make sure that you follow your gut and try it out. Just don't make the same mistake twice. So in watching your episodes back, another viewer question here, is there anything that you wish you would have changed or that you could have changed about your pitch to the Sharks? Ours went pretty much as planned, but um, sometimes we watch it for fun to amuse people um, because we're just talking so fast and uh, it is a really entertaining episode. Um, I don't really like to rewatch it, but when I do, um, I notice that I should have taken more pauses and spoken more clearly. So I guess, you know, just speaking refinements. Um, there's a great TED talk on uh, the top four speaking things that you should keep in mind when pitching. So I wish I would have watched that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got the deal anyway. And um, I think one big thing I learned from one big uh, VC in Silicon Valley was he said, um, we had just be enthusiastic. If you forget everything else, just be enthusiastic and your pitch will resonate because you need to be able to, as a leader of the company, inspire and delight and be a total just badass, uh, exciting person to listen to. And you hone in on that. If you can hone in on that and really leverage that, and that, that'll actually go a long way. I think that's evidenced by a lot of Shark Tank pitches. Yeah, Rose, you talked earlier about that authenticity, and I think that's similar. When you have genuine excitement about your company, it's, it's really hard to hide that. I think investors oh, totally. can respect that. So. Uh, I think Ms. called uh, my co-founder Miss Happy. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> this is going to be her nickname for the rest of her life. Uh, yeah, we just love the Chirps ladies' uh, enthusiasm, Leanne and I. Um, you guys are so inspiring to watch. I think that if anyone's looking for that kind of enthusiastic, you know, um, frame of reference to rewatch the Chirps episode and any other things that they have done, they've done a lot of pitch competitions. So you should Google that, everyone listening. I think that we that awesome that that sums it up. If <laughs> y'all haven't seen that photo, go to their website. And <laughs> that was, whose idea was that? That's, a, that's wonderful. Uh, Ours, we like to have fun. I think that's the most important thing, and it seems like Chelsea Lan also had this, which is, it doesn't really feel like work. I know it sounds so cheesy, but it really doesn't feel like work because it's so much fun. Um, and our brand is just who we are, and I think those are some of the best brands, are the ones who just reflect the values of the founders, because at the end of the day, who we connect with are people, not products. Um, and so if you can remember that, just, let your freak flag fly. Seriously, just be yourself. <laughs> uh, Rose, it looks like Chelsea may have dropped off. I may have lost it for a moment. But um, so what kind of customer testing? Uh, we have a question from Stephanie. What kind of customer testing did you do early on? And where and how did you find those potential customers? I love that question because customers are so, so important in a business and I think oftentimes you get really bogged down in thinking about product development or uh, working with influencers but the most time should be spent with your customers so love that question uh, the way that we tested in the beginning was that we actually lived in a co-living space so we lived with 20 other people in San Francisco we lived with 70 other people um, yeah, and then we also worked in co-working spaces. So we were constantly testing. Whenever we got a new product, a new seasoning, a new iteration, we would have taste testings no matter where we were. Uh, I think it's about taking away that fear of judgment or 
asking people to do things. And so um, we'd always make it fun and have a little like get together, but we would be very methodical in the way that we would test. We'd write down people's responses, get their feedbacks. Um, and then the other thing I would really push for is that there's no way as a product in the very beginning that you're going to get 100% of people. That's just not possible. So when you try to talk to everyone, you basically talk to no one. I think if you can be very clear about who your low paying fruits are, your early adopters, um, test with those people first. Um, and you know, there's a whole, we can go into how do you find who these early adopters are. You can do surveys, it could be anecdotal, uh, it could be based on market research, but ultimately figure out who your niche is and only talk to them. Uh, and I think that's the best advice I can give for people who are just starting out. So Rose, someone asked, of all the different insect species. <laughs> <laughs> Love that question. So there's over 2,000 varieties of edible insects that you can eat. And that's why it's so exciting because it's a whole another culinary world that chefs have never explored. So we're talking about all new te taste, textures, flavors um, that can be brought to market. But why we decided on crickets in the beginning is for many different reasons. One, um, I think generally crickets are friendlier. <laughs> so too many crickets. Uh, and so finding a, a, an insect that was more positive and crunchy is much better than something that's like worm-like, for example. So that was a huge distinction. The second one was that crickets are one of the most nutritious insects. So they're about 70% protein. It's a complete animal protein with all nine essential amino acids. Um, it has more B12 than salmon, uh, more iron than spinach. It's just a crazy, amazing. Sorry, I'm back. No worries. No worries. <laughs> My computer overheated. Okay. Oh, no. Technology uh, I'm just everyone. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Rose. I'm just talking about, Chelsea, which uh, type of insects or why we chose crickets. <laughs> Great question. Um, yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that there's been a supply of crickets already. So it is very challenging as business to work on multiple problems. We really only wanted to work on one, which is bring a product to market. We did not want to build the supply chain around that. We could be 20 years out if we we're trying to do everything all at once. And so because there are already cricket farms in existence, um, it was the natural next step for us to currently use the supply that was already there. So um, those are the three reasons we chose crickets, although now we're exploring other potential insects for the future. Uh, so TBD. <laughs> well, that brings me to a great question. What is next for both of your companies? What can we expect out of Turkey? Um, so for Lollyware, um, you guys may have seen that we launched the world's first edible hypercompostable drinking straw, which I gave you the preview there on the, the juice box use case. Um, for us, it's really about launching the straw with three to four big corporate partners this year and um, really focused on the, 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 the most impact that we can make with uh, huge partners. So replacing hundreds of millions of straws and like I mentioned, our goal by 2020 is to replace 1 billion plastic disposables. So that's what 2018 looks like. 2019 and beyond is really continuing to build out our innovation pipeline and do some significant product road mapping to see, you know, what are the top 10 biggest contaminants in the ocean? Um, how can Lollyware replace a percentage of those? So that could be utensils next, it could be bottle caps, it could be bottles. Um, we're open and we're gonna really keep honing in on the best technology possible. Um, for all of those products and then ultimately I think what we want to do which is a nice contrast to what Rose was saying about supply chain is that we only have enough seaweed you know for about seven billion straws but our queue uh, you know exceeds that so what we'll need to do is um, be developing new strains of seaweed and optimizing there and actually maybe even having our own seaweed farm so a lollyware kelp farm for example and integrating into the blue green economy and being able to secure a significant supply chain um, that's really the only way that uh, we'll be able to scale to meet demand so i think that's really exciting There's a lot of challenges along the way but as long as um you're committed to that mission and you have the right team around you anything is possible love that can't wait for future <laughs> for out of CD. Um, <laughs> So for Chirps, our mission has always been, we want to come up with um, insect replacements for everything from snacks all the way to meat. 
Um, initially, we see ourselves as a replacement for soy and whey protein. And I think oftentimes people don't think about it, but soy and whey are also um, big contributors to environmental problems. Um, and so initially we're looking at, well, we have a new flavor, sriracha, coming out. Woohoo! It's really amazing. Um, and in the future, there's so many other products on shelves that we can immediately replace uh, cricket protein um, to replace soy and whey protein. And then in the future, you know, like our goal has always been you go to the supermarket, you see a turkey burger, a beef burger, and then an into burger. Um, and that's the world that I think it needs to happen for us to rely much less on the resources the world provides to grow one pound of beef, for example. Thank you both so much for taking your time here to share with everybody. Um, just so all of you know, as a reminder, we will be sharing the recording of this um, so that you can share it with others who may be interested. And a giant thank you to Abe, um, since you're listening, for, for connecting all of us. We've already all planned to connect in San Francisco. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully friendships and business partnerships uh, to come. So Always. Thanks. All of you for listening in, um, and as a reminder, we'll have some additional resources on Alice to share if you're interested in pitching to Shark Tank. I think the link will be showing up at the end of this. Is that right, Sandra? Okay, great. So the, there will be a link here. You can also go on helloalice.com and just type in Shark Tank and find some resources there. So thanks to all, um, and happy Thursday to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.